Welcome to the well. Welcome to the well on this Sunday when we begin a journey. A journey into freedom. A journey where on the other side of the Red Sea waters we will celebrate the festival of God. What we're beginning this Sunday is a look at the story of the Exodus, the foundational story in all of the Bible. Not just for the Old Testament, but for the life of Jesus. Jesus, a Jew, would have been brought up on this story. Jesus then becomes the the new Moses in the New Testament. And guess what? When he is crucified and is raised from the dead, what the church believed is that this was the, the new Passover. It's why at the, the Lord's Supper we say, Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. A celebration of the freedom we have in Christ. And we're beginning a journey today. A journey with looking at how it is that we can give back to God in gratitude for what God has done for us to support the work of God in the world through this church, otherwise known as the annual giving appeal. This is a journey. This is why I have my my backpack with me that I wore when I walked the 500 miles of the Camino. Talk about a journey and talk about a life-giving journey. I will never give this backpack away. It is a reminder to me of a life-giving time in my life. And let me just tell you this. As we give back our resources to God in gratitude, we are set free. Set free from the, the, the power of money on our lives. And whenever we use our resources for the work of God, it is life-giving and joyful. Now, as we go on this journey, every Sunday we have a different person bear witness to us of why giving back to God through St. Timothy's matters to them. And we begin every appeal by having the chair of our annual giving appeal committee to just tell us a little bit about the nuts and bolts of this before in subsequent weeks having people bear witness to why this matters. I hope you will go on this journey with us. I hope you'll find your, your backpack to freedom. And thank you for all that you have done to be part of God's work in the world through St. Timothy's. And now I want to invite Jess Kennedy, our junior warden, to say a few words. Hi, I'm Jess Kennedy junior warden and chair of the annual giving appeal committee. Today, believe it or not, we begin the first phase for our appeal for 2025. This is the time when we ask you to consider making a pledge of a financial gift for the coming year. As we did last year, our campaign is broken into two parts. In the first phase, the focus is on gratitude and reflection. And the second part focuses on action. That is where we ask you to get those pledges in. Brochures will be mailed around the midpoint of the campaign. As always, your brochure will include information about giving at St. Timothy's and also a pledge card. You can either return the pledge card or pledge online. Remember that if you pledge online, there are two steps. One step is to pledge And another step is to actually set up the online giving to fulfill that pledge. The campaign will conclude on November 3rd with a celebratory breakfast. On Sundays during the campaign, you will be hearing from members of the congregation as they reflect on their experiences at St. Timothy's and talk about why giving is important to them. The theme of this year's campaign is With All, for all, no exceptions. What could possibly embody the life and mission of this church more? One of the reasons I love this place is that everyone is included, no one left behind. We are all journeying together through this life. 
As you may expect, operating expenses for the church are expected to increase next year. Please keep this in mind as you ponder your gift for 2025. As members of this congregation, we have ample opportunities to contribute our time, talent, and treasure. On behalf of the Annual Giving Appeal Committee, I invite you to join us in supporting the mission of St. Timothy's, a place where we journey together with all, for all, no exceptions. Thank you. For freedom, Christ has set us free. So let us depart the empire and rat race to celebrate a festival to the Lord. We will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and daughters. We will go with our flocks and herds. We will go in peace and joy, and we will all go together. For all, with all, no exceptions. Good morning, friends. Happy Sunday. Welcome to the well. I am preaching today, so you're going to see my face a bunch in this video. Uh, but let's begin with our prayer that's assigned for today. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin, and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work, and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Image of God's face, 
Let us bring an end to fear and danger. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where all are named, their songs and visions heard. And house proclaim from floor to rock all are welcome all are welcome all are welcome in this place a reading from the book of exodus afterward moses and aaron went to pharaoh and said Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, so that they may celebrate a festival to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should listen to him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has revealed himself to us. Let us go a three days journey into the wilderness to sacrifice to the Lord our God, or he will fall upon us with our pestilence or sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their work? Get to your labors. Pharaoh continued, now they are more numerous than people of the land. And yet you want them to stop laboring? That same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people, as well as their supervisors, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves but you shall require of them the same quantity of bricks as they have made previously. Do not diminish it, for they are lazy. That is why they cry. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on them. Then they will pay attention to it and not deceptive words. Pharaoh's officials said to him, how long shall this fellow be a snare to us? Send the people away so that they may serve the Lord their God. Do not yet, do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go serve the Lord your God. But which ones are to go? Moses said. We will go with your young and, old, and our old. We will go with our sons and daughters and with our flocks and herds, because we have the Lord's festival to celebrate. He said to them, The Lord indeed will be with you, if ever I let your little ones go with you. Plainly, you have some evil purpose in mind. No, never. Your men may go and serve the Lord, for that is what you are asking. And then they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Psalm 19. The heavens declare your glory, O God, and the firmament shows your handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep you have set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his ch chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the other, uttermost edge of the heavens, and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. Your law, O God, is perfect and revives the soul. Your testimony is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. Your statutes are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of you is clean and endures forever. Your judgments are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than fine gold. Sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often one offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be made whole and sound, 
and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. The Gospel for today is from the eighth chapter of Mark. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the son of man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again he said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Here at the Spirit is saying to God's people. Hey friends. Happy Sunday and happy, I don't know, back in the day we used to call this rally day, <laughs> the first day of Sunday school. We're now doing, of course, kids and their people. So we've got um, our family unit based um, education, Christian education on Sunday mornings. Very excited about that starting up weekly, all kinds of fun stuff there. Um, of course, it's also stewardship season, um, which you may recall from last year, I love because we get to be part of things spoilers for the sermon. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's reconnect with the story from Exodus. That's what I'm going to preach about today. And you've already heard some of this before. I know Roger has talked about this on a couple of occasions. Um, but this story is, is kind of pivotal. The, the whole Exodus narrative for sure. But this one little part is kind of important. So contextually, you remember the 10 plagues of Egypt, right? Um, this story that we have today is kind of between, it's, we're not done with the plagues yet. It's uh, just after the eighth plague of locusts and just before the ninth plague of darkness. Um, so you've got this, like you've, you've gone through this cycle multiple times. Moses going to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. And Pharaoh sometimes saying yes, sometimes saying no, but then his heart being hardened and saying, no, they cannot go. And then Moses using his staff and calling another plague down. There's lots of stuff we could talk about around that. Um, a big part of it seems to be um, sort of historically and, and in the literature, it's about showing how the God of the Israelites, the God of the, the Jews, is more powerful than the other gods around. Hence all these plagues to show that power. Regardless, this story is not about the plagues. This story is about Moses saying, no, we're taking everybody. Spoilers. So you've got the plague of locusts that have come and eaten all of the crops, um, which of course is a horrible thing when you live um, certainly on the Nile, which is fertile, but also kind of on the edge of the desert. 
you need the Nile, you need those crops. So they have no food. And uh, Moses has gone back to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And Pharaoh's advisors have said to Pharaoh, dude, like, could you please? This is a lot. We have a lot to deal with here. Could you just please let them go and then we can figure out our problems? And Pharaoh listens to them briefly and says, okay, all right, who are you, who are you gonna take when you go, Moses? And Moses says, we will take our young and our old, our men and our women, and our flocks and our herds. He's saying, we are going to take everything with us, not just our families, which is important enough, right? Um, but he says, we are taking your potential workforce. We are taking our wealth. That's what the flocks and the herds are. We are taking the current workforce. We are taking this whole thing because this is who we are and we are going and it's all or none. And Pharaoh's like, well, you can take the old people. That'd be fine. Take the, take the men out because the women could have more children and the children can grow up and don't take your herds, right? And Moses is like, no, nah, man. And so he leaves and that he uses his staff and they get the ninth plague, the plague of darkness. This is a great story. <laughs> um, and I just want to put a pin in that for just a half a second and say, um, this isn't even that weird a story, but my husband and I were talking last night about um, scripture and about kind of these wild stories that we find, particularly in the Hebrew scripture. And I love that they're weird. I honestly think that's kind of what's important about it. They're strange and they might even be uncomfortable. They might feel too violent, too sexy, too political, too whatever. And it's because that's what our lives are like. These stories, I mean, maybe our lives are not like a guy with a staff saying, let my people go and causing a plague of darkness, but we are imprisoned <laughs> and we are needing to push back for ourselves and for all the people who are with us all the people who are with us against oppressive systems like Pharaoh, like the government of Egypt. Anyway, I like the weirdness. I like, I like that it's awkward. So Roger has already talked about this, right? About how this story is about how as Christians, this is going to be our focus for the coming weeks. It's the, the focus for um, things like stewardship, um, for kids and their people and for other spaces in this congregation. You should be familiar, this church says God loves everyone, no exceptions. So when we move forward, everyone is going. Every one of us. Now that's not the way of the world, is it? No child left behind, left children behind. And even whether, whether or not we're trying to do that, whether or not we have these you know, big plans where nobody's going to be left behind, Someone is, it's, it's a struggle. And sometimes people are left behind on purpose. Some people, sometimes people are imprisoned, are in slavery, are captured on purpose. Moses says, let my people go. Let my people go from what? We have certainly um, obvious imprisonment. We have people uh, in our prison system who shouldn't be there, who have been wrongfully accused, wrongfully convicted. We have people who have been on death row for 30 years waiting for the hammer to fall. And we have people who have done the things that we've put them in prison for. And they're in there rotting and they are not being given the things that they need to change. They're just being punished. That's an obvious imprisonment. But there's all kinds of other ones. Rogers talked about the rat race, that we get imprisoned by the culture around us, that we have to keep going, keep going, keep going. And that's in the story too. Pharaoh doesn't just say, no, don't take them. Pharaoh then says to the overseers, make it harder for them to make the bricks that I'm making them build. I can't, I can't remember if it's give them more straw or take away the straw, either way, it makes it so much harder and it's, it's like a form of um, resentment. It's a form of deeper punishment for them wanting to be out of slavery. We are frequently, even though when we love our jobs, 
or we love the work that we do with our children, um, you know, taking them to after school programs and things like that. Um, when we love our volunteer work, there are so many things that we can enjoy our work with, but we get so stuck in the idea of accomplishment or busyness or whatever the word success means to you. Um, or trying not to be the opposite of what we think of the opposite of success is a failure. We get so tied up in that stuff. Some of us get imprisoned by how we think our bodies are meant to look, um, by weight or something like that, right? Um, we get stuck in, do I look like, do I look enough like a woman, right? I don't tend to wear makeup. Um, I don't care that much, but I know that the world around me kind of expects me to perform that more. Um, men in this video, in this congregation, I can imagine that there are lots of ways in which the culture around you is expecting you and maybe to some extent imprisoning you in a sense of how to be a man. Are you man enough? Are you manly enough? Maybe that has to do with fixing cars or something like that, which has nothing to do with being a man. Maybe it just has something to do with, with your worth, with, with how you act. All of these things are traps. All of these things are chains that tie us down. And we get so imprisoned by these things. We, we, it's not just that our, our bosses or the corporations that we work for or whatever are keeping us imprisoned and holding us down. That can be part of it. But also, we internalize it. We think, I have to do this. And like parents out there, listen, I am a parent as well. And I have, I think I would go so far as to say I have some shame that I haven't pushed my kids harder to do more extracurricular activities. You hear all those stories about like soccer moms having to run from this to that to the other and the kids are doing all the different things. My kids are doing great. <laughs> I love them, they're amazing. And I just hope and I, and I worry that I haven't given them all the opportunities that they need to succeed because the world is telling me that they aren't doing enough. I don't think that's true, but I feel stuck in it. I don't know about you, maybe, maybe you have similar kinds of feelings, regardless of how involved your kids are. We get stuck in these spaces of imprisonment and we imprison other people in them as well. Even things as unimportant as maybe game playing. You may have heard that I've started a new job at a board game bar in uh, College Hill. This is not an ad for them, don't worry. Um, but I, my job is to talk to people and to recommend and teach games. And I love it, it's so good. And what's interesting, um, very specifically about that, is that I think it's really important to teach a game well. A bad teach is so not fun. And you get stuck in the middle of a game not knowing what you're doing, you have to ask questions, which in and of itself isn't that bad, but if you don't know what you're doing, you're confused, um, or worse, the person who taught you is kind of condescending or rude. I've had that happen. It's horrible. That's not good. It is important to me when I teach people how to play games that there's a story behind it, that they enjoy even the learning aspect of it, that they are looking forward to playing, that the play is fun, you would think. This is so important to me. And it's really important to me that everyone has an opportunity to play, to be part of it. Um, when I'm playing a complex game, um, or even not a complex game, it's important to me that the people I am playing with feel that they are part of it, that they have a chance of winning, a chance of participation. So I will offer advice if they want it, even if it hurts my gameplay, because I want them to feel like they're connected, right? It's also important to me, and, and this happened just the other day at, at this place, um, there's a woman who came in and I said, hey, would you like to play a game? And she said, I have a visual impairment. Do you have any games that would work for me? And I thought, wow, we've left her behind. Because no, we did not. Um, I have a couple of games at my house that could work for her um, because my father is blind. And so we have a handful of games that we've 
that are specifically for blind people, but also work for people with visual impairment. I didn't have them at the shop. Um, and I felt bad about that. Now it's just a game, but we had a great conversation about it. I said, I would love to put some more things in our shelves that you could play things with, you know, large print numbers and, and high contrast and things like that, that would help her. It is important, even in something as small as that, that we remember that we are all part of the body of Christ. Every single one of us, whatever our experience, whatever our hurt, whatever we think our impairments are, whatever we think other people's impairments are, that we are all part of this body of Christ. And that is key. Other people's impairments. I'm sure you heard this week there was a whole racist thing that was said um, about our Haitian brothers and sisters in Springfield, Ohio. It's a long-standing racist trope that people of color, that Asians eat pets. I don't understand it. I don't have to understand it. It's horrible. And it's, it's propagated by lots of people. It's been around for a long time. When we propagate those things, we are leaving people behind. We are keeping people imprisoned. And sometimes we don't even think about it. We don't know. And yet all of us are part of the body of Christ because the body of Christ includes everyone, even the people we don't want, even the people we don't want to admit that we don't want. I want to I want to end with a, a short um, story, I guess. Uh, my husband is a teacher in the public school system, and he's been there for 15 years. And he's very sad right now because his school is closing. They're closing Riverview East um, because the enrollment numbers are down. Fair enough. There's a whole other story there, but we don't have time for that. He is sad for a lot of reasons. He has built community there. He's uh, been with these many of these teachers for a very long time. But a big reason why he's sad is because those teachers commit so much of their time and energy and love to those students. Riverview has served underprivileged um, students in the lower, like on the, on the edge of the river for a long time. And there's a student this past year who, like many of their students, got pregnant early, um, has family members in prison, comes from an impoverished background. The kind of person that many folks would just not expect to be able to do much with her life, which is not fair, but that's how the world imprisons us, right? And these teachers saw that she had a gift in art. And so a couple of them asked her to do some pieces for their classrooms and she was so excited. And then they took up a collection and commissioned her to do a big piece for a quiet room in their school. And she was so excited. It's a beautiful piece. And that plus how they continued to, to pour into her and show her that she is talented and good and beautiful and worthy means that when she graduated this past spring, she applied to and was accepted to Savannah College of Art and Design, where she is now. And that wouldn't have happened if those teachers had not chosen to say, we're not leaving anybody behind because we are all part of the body of Christ. We live our life cruciform. Jesus says, live your life like this. It's not easy, but it can be so beautiful when we can invite everyone in, when we can bring everyone along, when we can say to the pharaohs of the world, we're not leaving without everyone. Amen.
Dear God, this week we somberly remembered the events of September 11th, 2001. The four terrorist attacks that killed around 3,000 people as they began a normal workday and the tens of thousands injured or made ill by these events. We especially remember all those whose physical remains were never recovered and all those who continue to mourn their loss. We also grieve the more recent loss of so many people in the Middle East, especially, ch especially children and the hostages who have died thus far because of warfare. Dear mother and father of us all, remind us that each of the lost people we remember today has been claimed forever as your blessed children now resting in your loving care. May we find comfort in your promise that nothing can separate us from your love and that resurrection is your final word for this troubled world. Please God, don't ever let us get accustomed to the devastation in our world as something predictable and familiar. Replace our complacency about such horrors with a resolve to help you create a better world, blessed with hope and trust in the essential goodness of the life you have created for all of us. We ask you to remember all those on our prayer list, especially Stacy and Tom Vivaut, the family of Eric Keffer, Marianne White, Essie Adams, Judy Willoughby, Mike Rathsack, Debbie Rathsack, Eva Brewer, John Willis, Ryan Griffith, Evelyn and Olivia Nemesek, Walter Brueggemann, Sayla Maisie Hart, and Wendy Jones, and for those you now name, We remember those who have died, especially Karen Sanders. Heavenly Mother and Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, let's close with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive a blessing. But before I say it, I wanna invite you wherever you are, however you're sitting or uh, maybe driving listening to this, I don't know. Uh, if you're driving, don't close your eyes. <laughs> um, but however you are sitting um, or standing, perhaps, I wanna invite you to ground into the floor. That is um, where your feet are. Just take a moment to notice how your feet are touching the floor, how perhaps they feel in your socks or your shoes and feel the, the earth, the, the floor certainly below you, but the earth below you, the earth that God created holding you to it, holding you up, supporting you as you walk through this next week. We are not above this creation, we are a part of it. Feel that connection through the soles of your feet as you receive this blessing. 
My friends, you are the beloved children of God. God sees your suffering. God sees your gifts and loves you through and because of both of them. Receive God's blessing of love, connection, and challenge. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let us go forth rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God.